Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone and today we are celebrating the life and career of the greatest entertainer of all time, Judy Garland. Our guest is widely considered to be the preeminent world expert on Judy Garland. He's written seven books about her and her films, especially The Wizard of Oz, with one more on the way. He's won two Emmy Awards for television documentaries about Judy. His liner notes for Capitol Records 1995 Judy Garland 25th Anniversary Retrospective got him a Grammy nomination. He provided the audio commentary on many of Judy's DVD films, and he regularly appears on the Turner Classic Movie Network and other networks to discuss Judy Garland's body of work and legacy. I am thrilled and delighted to welcome John Fricke to our show. John, thank you so much for being here. Well, this is this is a privilege. I, and after an introduction like that, I can just say goodbye. And it was nice meeting everybody because we can't follow that. But thank you. What was it about Judy Garland that made you such a devoted fan from such a young age? Well, it, Wizard of Oz was the was the opening uh, was the door opening. No uh, black and white to Technicolor reference implied. Uh, I fell in love. I love music. My parents encouraged uh, our whole family loved music and musical movies and musical TV shows. And in 1956, there were an awful lot of musical TV shows. Oz just spoke to me, though. Um, I, I think it speaks to every kid. You don't. Ha it doesn't matter if you're a little boy or a little girl. You identify with her because she is such a, a communicator, and you go along that journey with her. And uh, when I found out that she made other movies that she made record albums beside The Wizard of Oz, uh, I was, I wanted them. I, I was a very easy buy at Christmas time and my birthday because if you bought me Oz books and Judy Garland records, I was in heaven. Well, what was it about Judy's voice, do you think, that resonated with people so powerfully? Well, this is not my theory, but I think one of the things that has been pointed out is that there was no real transition from her speaking voice, whether as Judy Garland or as a character, into her singing voice. It was the same mellow, warm, uh, tremulous flow of one to another. So you never got the sense that she was acting and then she was singing. I mean, it wasn't uh, operatic. It wasn't operetta. It was natural. And uh, everything about her was natural. Everything about her was real. It is her vulnerability. She gave you everything that she was and had no protective shield at any time. And uh, that was not good for her, but boy, was it good for us and for the history of entertainment. Because again, as you said, they, they don't have them like that. And now they had very few of them then. Tell me about the time you saw her in concert. I'm lucky enough to be have been old enough to see her in concert and when I was 14 I went with a couple other teenage Garland fans and one of their sets of parents and we drove down to see her in Chicago and that was the first time and then two years later she was back in Chicago right after playing the palace the third time so this was September 1967 and I was 16 and old enough to go on my own and uh, met her after the concert in the Ambassador East pump room uh, restaurant at 2 30 in the morning and the shows were so extraordinary, especially the closing night. I mean, this was, the act was an hour of vaudeville, you know, the tap dancing trio, the comic, the juggler, half hour intermission. And then Judy came on at 10 and did about 90 minutes. Well, closing night in Chicago, she came on at 10 and was on until five after 12. Uh, three extra numbers. Uh, and, and the audience just wouldn't go home. After Over the Rainbow, which was the third encore, uh, she took her bows, the house lights came up, they brought down the asbestos curtain, this was at the opera house, and nobody left. They didn't think they hadn't gotten their money's worth, they just didn't want it to be over. And you had 3,600 people ranging in age, as we always used to say, from fetal to fatal, because you had kids whose parents had brought them to see Dorothy and many teenagers. But they started, they kept clapping and chanting, we want Judy. The orchestra was out of the pit. Uh, it just went on and on. and probably two or three minutes. And finally, all of a sudden, the house lights went down, the curtain went up, the orchestra got back in the pit, and she came back from the dressing room smoking a cigarette and picked up the mic and said, I smoke now, by the way, I'm old enough, put out the cigarette and sang San Francisco, 22 songs. And uh, I've had several pivotal emotional moments in my life, and I think everybody has those. But this was the first that night when we were walking up the aisle because of course we were all down at the edge of the stage, reaching and cheering and requesting songs. Um, we were right down at the front. So to get up back out of the theater, it had took a while while everybody else moved out. And we finally started to walk back up the aisle to the exit. 
and I moved in to one of the empty rows just on impulse because I was like propelled there because this emotional wash came over me of that I can't explain because it came out of nowhere. But I remember thinking, oh, everybody I love and everybody I'm ever going to love should have been here because I'm never going to be able to explain what she made happen for these two hours and five minutes, that this was just as good as life gets, that kind of joy, that kind of emotional exhilaration. Wow, and you sure make me wish I had been there. You've published several books about The Wizard of Oz and you've basically been the go-to person for Warner Brothers, Turner Entertainment and MGM for most of their Wizard of Oz video projects over the past 30 years. What is it about that movie that has captivated you so much? Well, I guess I, I, I majored in journalism at college at Northwestern 100 years ago, and I always liked to write and I always liked to sing. So I had all of these tie-ins to entertainment for myself. And when it came to The Wizard of Oz, I wanted to know, and this was preteen. I was seven, eight, nine years old going to the downtown Milwaukee Public Library, and I wasn't over in the, you know, Curious George and his hoo-ha section. I was over in the arts and uh, music and drama section, the adult section, asking to see the Milwaukee Journal for 1939 so I could see what the ads looked like for The Wizard of Oz. I was going through Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature, looking up everything on Judy and Frank Baum and The Wizard of Oz. There was, there was this... Uh, internal research thing about me that I wanted to know everything I could because it fascinated me so, whether it was the story, the characters, the songs, the, the script, all of that. And of course, when a movie is as, um, becomes as iconic as The Wizard of Oz, there is so much to find out. I never planned to uh, write about it or talk about it. This was, this was just my, my passion though and my hobby. And I was encouraged to write about it when I joined the International Wizard of Oz Club at 11 and the Judy Garland Clubs when I was 12 or 13, you know, put something in the fanzines because already I was writing. I, it didn't pour out of me. I've never been one of those people who is compelled or propelled to write. It's, it's agony to use Judy's word. But when the Oz books started to come out, I was, uh, many people were kind enough to reach out and they wanted to talk about collecting and collectibles. What I have amassed over the years is the stuff that meant something to me, uh, photocopies of a lot of the Oz scripts and as much production file memorabilia as there is and behind the scenes photographs. That's what coalesced in the green book, the 50th anniversary Wizard of Oz pictorial history with the green cover because uh, there had been a book about the making of The Wizard of Oz about a decade prior, and we all thought it was infallible. Well, when we did the Green Book, all of a sudden I was turning up all this material that uh, the other author either hadn't seen or didn't know enough about Oz going in. For her, the project was a good idea. For me, the project was a, a lifelong trek, I guess. So we were able to write more honestly about the production, the order in which it was made, what the reviews said, uh, all of that kind of stuff. And that book opened up the doors for everything else that has happened since 1989. So I, for me, it's, it's always a fascination with Oz and with Judy. How was this stuff put together? How was it created? Who picked the songs for Carnegie Hall for Judy? Or, or did she pick them? Who put the palace act together? What did she think about different songs? What were her favorite songs? Why? Much has been said and written about how Judy was treated as a youngster at MGM. She was given uppers, she was given downers, she was constantly admonished about her weight and she was overworked. Does it surprise you that her mother did so little to protect her? Well, again, that is the very black and white recounting of some aspects of her life at MGM. Nobody knew what kind of trouble you could get in taking those medications, those pills. Nobody knew that they were habit forming. And as Jimmy, Virginia Gum said, if mama knew they were going to be bad for Judy, she wouldn't have let Judy take them. Now, that being said, Ethel Gum uh, had put the girls, the Gum sisters, on some kind of uh, they didn't have amphetamines in the late 20s and early 30s, but there was some kind of caffeine derivative things that she could give them to keep them peppy if they were going to do four vaudeville shows a day. This was all 
technically harmless or comparatively harmless in people's view. Nobody knew that if you started, you were going to need more and more of that just to get up to a certain level of energy. Um, nobody knew that you were going to need something then to bring you down. There's no question she was overworked at MGM, especially from about the second year onward, once they knew what they had in Judy Garland. And they were all over her for sure about her appearance because Judy never got to be any taller than four foot 11. And when you're four foot 11, as she said, you eat a plate of French fries and it shows. And she was a healthy kid, Midwestern kid with a Midwestern appetite who'd never had any trouble eating what she wanted. And if you look at even the movies where she's a little thick in the waist and Wizard of Oz is one of them, it's like she was never, she was barely even plump. She didn't have an hourglass figure though. They wanted her to be Lana Turner. They wanted her to be Anne Rutherford. Eventually they wanted her to be Ava Gardner and Liz Taylor and all of those people. But that wasn't Judy's, Judy's strength. Judy was the real person, uh, not the glamorous person. She could be glamorous, Lord knows, and she was many times. So I think you have to factor all of that in before you say MGM should be summoned up and hung. Uh, there are many things that they did wrong by her. Well, uh, let me ask you this. Do you think that those things that they did wrong by her made it inevitable that she would have emotional problems and substance abuse problems throughout her life? I think they contributed to that. I think the fact that her parents' marriage was as rocky as it was, and Judy and her sisters were always being taken off on tour and away from their father. Their mother was doing this to protect them from the rumors in small towns about their father and young men in the towns. Judy was far too young to understand that at the time. I think uh, the fact that when she got to MGM, she was 13 years old and into puberty and a time that is a crisis mode moment for most young people. Uh, and then being lambasted about her weight and the fact that she wasn't pretty enough and we've got to put discs in your nostrils to make your nose look better. And uh, what are we going to do with your teeth and your hair? And and then being surrounded, as she, she said, you know, I was at MGM for months and months and I never saw another girl who looked like me. They all looked like Lana Turner and Ann Rutherford. So I think that all contributed. And then the overwork and the feeling in herself that she had to do anything she could to please these people who were giving her these chances and starring her in The Wizard of Oz and co-starring her with Mickey Rooney. And she had to be up to speed and uh, no pun intended. And there was this sense of um, wanting desperately to please and to be made to feel that she was only valued for her voice, not for her appearance, not for her personal persona. She was the one who sang. And, and I think that only multiplied with the need for taking more medication to balance, more sleeping pills to counteract more uh, amphetamines. And again, just not wanting to let anybody down. And uh, her mother did not do right by her in many ways. There's a classic MGM memo. Uh, Judy was 21 and working on Girl Crazy. And she had just come from three years of one film after another. And she collapsed under the uh, whip cracking of Busby Berkeley. And there's a memo that says Judy's doctors told us that she cannot dance for, I think it's six weeks or eight weeks. But we spoke to her mother and she said, Judy can be back on her feet in three weeks. You know, it was like, don't let the momentum stop. And MGM executives said later on, I, I, we did not do right by Judy, you know, we, but she'd come up from nothing. We thought we were doing her the greatest gift in the world. And we all thought we could just ride along with her. So I don't think there's anybody who worked in Hollywood at any point who won't tell you in 20s, 30s, 40s on the desperation of everybody in that town all the time. Will my option be picked up? What if my next picture isn't as big a hit as the one before this? Uh, it's, it's, it's cyclical. And because of her vulnerability, she, I think, fell uh, subject to more angst and worry and um, always the sense that she wasn't good enough. She had this miraculous talent that was so natural. She went from being 20 and worrying about how, how am I going to be as good as I was at 15 and 30? How am I going to be as good as I was at 20 and 40? How am I going to be again where she didn't know where this came from? She didn't have uh, training the way uh, an instinctive actor does. She just did it. And right. he expected her to be magic. 
Although Judy Garland is best known for her musicals, she made some movies purely as an actress where she didn't sing. She made The Clock in 1945, she did Judgment at Nuremberg in 1961 and got Oscar and Golden Globe nominations for that role, and she did A Child is Waiting in 1963. Do you think Judy's acting skills have been sufficiently appreciated by the critics? I think Judy's acting skills have come to be more appreciated because you look at her now and Elaine Stritch said it best. Elaine Stritch always said that if she had a big opening night, she would spend the afternoon or the morning or whatever getting ready. She would watch a Judy Garland movie because she said it taught her to be absolutely honest when she got on stage. She said, never could I catch Judy Garland in a false move. And she said, and never did I catch Judy Garland acting. And I think, uh, the appreciation for ability uh, didn't come until you realized how really wonderful she was just by being, by her reality, her sense of, of who the character was and, and putting that out there. But you don't catch her acting. She wasn't, she wasn't Greer. She wasn't Betty. She wasn't Joan. You didn't see her teeth all over the scenery. Um, it was, it's, even I could go on singing her last film, which is basically a soap opera with songs, so many people have said she is so underplayed and that's what saves that character from being uh, a soap opera character she is real you identify with her uh, and i think that's the case in every film she made in every song she sang have you ever forgiven the academy for not giving judy the oscar for her performance in a star is born well it's not so much the academy it is as it is the people who vote for the academy i think there you've got to point the finger at jack warner who put all of his power and money behind A Star is Born and then mercilessly cut it by half an hour two weeks into its premiere engagements. Uh, most of the country, most of the world never saw the complete film. And then he did nothing to campaign for it. He just wrote it off. Uh, I think if they had been reminded in January and February of 1955, what the reviews for A Star is Born had said in, 19, in September and October of the preceding year, uh, there would have been more of a chance because, again, I think it was Films and Review that in its great review of A Star is Born said, you know, where will Judy Garland ever again get this kind of opportunity? This is this is extraordinary. She has to do it all and she does. It's ironic, too, then seven years later when she was nominated for Judgment at Nuremberg for the straight acting part, Rita Moreno, who, of course, won the Oscar for West Side Story deservedly, but she won it for a singing and dancing part with acting. Uh, Judy couldn't have gotten it for A Star is Born seven years before when it was all of those things, you know, times 10. I, I have learned that there is a lot of uh, jealousy and a lot of envy in the world uh, for people. And I think Judy created a lot of that just by being as good as she was and by being as intrinsically nice as she was. Uh, just about anybody who knew her speaks of her that way. And uh, there, there is this sense, too, that when she wasn't nice, when she was, in quotes, temperamental, it was mostly out of her own fears of not being able to go out and be good, not being able to go out and be as much Judy Garland as she was supposed to be. And the overriding fear, the last, on and off, the last 20 years of her life, of never having a cent to show for the hours and days and weeks and months and years of work she had done. Well, the, you're getting now into some personal choices. I want to ask you about her marriages. She was married five times. At least three of her husbands were well known to be gay. Vincent Manelli, Mark Heron, and Mickey Deans. Why did she keep marrying gay men? Well, it's an age-old philosophy, and it's so, so much age-old that it's a cliche, and I don't know how much it, it holds up, but isn't it true that uh, boys look for their mothers when they pick out a girl, and, and girls look for their fathers when they pick out a husband, and Judy's father, having all of that compassion and having been, uh, at best, bisexual, uh, I think you look for that kind of compassion. You look for that kind of instinctive understanding and communication. It was almost a curse that she was fated to go uh, through relationships with men who were, um, I'm not going to come out and say the three men you mentioned were blatantly gay. I think they were blatantly bisexual. And uh, I think they all loved her in their own ways, but their own ways weren't enough to give her what she wanted in terms of 
being a woman, being a wife, uh, there, there was always that sense of they're marrying Judy Garland. They're not marrying Francis Gum. Do you know? Well, you mentioned that. And then in 1952, she married her third husband, Sid Luft, who most definitely was not gay, but he was considered by some people to be an opportunistic con man. What was your impression of him? Well, I worked for Sid for a year in 1980 and 81, and I saw him at close range five days a week. He was a man of endless charm, but he was in many ways um, a, a, a not terribly honest wheeler dealer. Uh, he had this, his history was like that before I worked for him, certainly after I worked for him. He, he was, again, a very complex person. I think he cared about her. I think where he failed her was in his gambling and his uh, extravagant expenditure and in failing to pay the taxes and in not putting anything aside. I mean, she was making record sums of money in the 1950s. Uh, London, Broadway, Hollywood, Star is Born, TV, records, Las Vegas. Nothing to show for it. Nothing. Uh, but again, he thought they needed the big house and the servants and all of that kind of stuff. It was, uh, and I think he looked at her as somebody, you know, she was always good for cash. He could book her into Las Vegas for three weeks and come away with $120,000, which in the 50s was a lot of money. Now, well, did you read Sid Love's book, uh, Judy and I, My Life with Judy Garland? Yes, it, it should be right next to Little Women and Tom Sawyer as fiction. Really? Well, to a certain extent. I mean, that book was written by Sid with several, Sid tried to write a book at least four different times from the 60s into the early 2000s and different writers. And um, I was asked to vet the first part of a manuscript that he submitted. It had been sold to a publisher here in New York and I was known there and they said, will you come and look at this? And it was in the, it was about 1990 and he didn't remember his own life that well at that point. He had remembered when he talked to Gerald Frank for that book in the early 70s more clearly. But again, it's all self-aggrandizing. It's all, Sid Luft's overriding theory is, uh, I was Judy's savior. And it was like, well, no, uh, Judy Garland would have needed much less saving if you had done your job as the manager and the uh, agent and as a husband. Uh, again, all very gray. Um, Sid, Sid was complex and Sid had his own problems and hangups and machismo and bravado, but he gave her Lorna and Joe. And I think that is, that is the best thing you can say uh, for Sid. Her two children. Well, in, in 2019, a documentary about Judy's relationship with Sid Luft was released by Showtime. What did you think of it? I haven't seen it. Let's put it that way. I understand the clips of Judy and performance are wonderful. Well, go figure. Uh, the people who put it together are the people who worked on Sid's book after he died and cobbled it together from different places. Again, it never touches on the reasons that there were so many problems, that there wasn't any money, that Judy was uh, bereft and upset and well, why? You know, she had just come from working. And again, it was, no, you've got to go out and work again because we don't have any cash. Uh, I've talked to so many people who knew Sid in London in the fifties and here in the States in the sixties and how he would go to the box office and just grab handfuls of cash and disappear with them. And uh, so that there'd be no money for Judy and for him at the end of the engagement. Well, Sid Luft wasn't the only con man to get involved with Judy. Her <laughs> managers, Freddie Fields and David Beagleman, did a real number on her, too. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, Sid, um, when Judy was really healthy again, after being told in 1959 she could never under any circumstances ever work anymore, uh, and she came back and she started doing the one-woman concerts in London and Paris and Europe that led to Carnegie Hall, uh, he wanted somebody else to manage her. You know, he thought, no, let somebody else handle this. She's healthy, da, 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 da. And he more or less sold her to Freddie and David, uh, who were just starting Freddie Fields Associates. Freddie and David founded their agency on Judy's comeback in 1961, 62, and 63. They're the ones who sold her to CBS for a series, convincing her that she would have uh, financial freedom if she did this. Now, a series was not right for Judy Garland. She was an event. 
she didn't need to be on TV every week. But by selling her to CBS for the single largest monetary figure ever offered to a talent deal, $24 million for four seasons, they then didn't know anything about TV programming. Uh, when CBS slotted Judy opposite Bonanza, they didn't care. After an hour of Ed Sullivan on CBS, two hours of variety back to back, no, that all of that doesn't make sense. Plus the fact that they were getting, the, I think the show was budgeted originally at $150,000 a week. And out of that, they got their percentage um, as producers of the show with Judy. They got a percentage as her agents. They got a percentage for any other talent they booked on the show, on camera, behind camera. They were raking in tens of thousands of dollars every week from that show. There was money she had made in the preceding three years in concerts and that sort of thing that, uh, again, she never, ever saw. Well, uh, why do you think the show was canceled after 26 episodes? The shows, uh, I have the box set. These are really good shows for the most part. The comedy sketches are not good, but her performances are spectacular. Why did it get canceled? Well, some of the reasons I've just told you, the wrong time slot, the wrong night of the week, the wrong opposition. You know, NBC had Bonanza, which was entrenched as the number one show, had been for seasons, and it was in color. Uh, the first week of Judy's so show, she got twice the rating of Bonanza, but it was one of the weaker shows of the series because CBS was trying to remake her into kind of Dinah Shore and Gary Moore, this kind of warm, folksy, at-home personality, which was one of the best statements about the Garland show, I think, came from, from a critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. They hired Judy because she was a star, and then they wouldn't let her be one. Mm. And uh, the show was fumfed around in terms of format week after week, uh, which all of that was unsettling to her, yet she showed up, she kicked it across uh, some of the greatest musical moments in TV history in those 26 weeks. And CBS refused to turn, put it on another night. They didn't give her the opportunity to, you know, be switched to a better time slot, a better evening. No, they just summarily wrote it off. And, um, well, Mel Torme, who worked on the Judy Garland show, wrote a scathing book about Judy called The Other Side of the Rainbow with Judy Garland on the Dawn Patrol. I was devastated by that book. I read it when I was in my early 20s. What did you think of it? Well, it's it, so much of the facts about the series he got wrong in his rememberings from seven years earlier. What he didn't get wrong were all the conversations he remembered word for word for word and all the uh, traumatic stuff that happened. And that book came out, it was the first book, which is a, something to underscore. He was the first person to cash in on Judy's death by writing a book. The trouble was that people then took that book as scripture and verse that, you know, the Judy Garland show was terrible. She was a mess. Uh, it wasn't worth it. Oh, there were fleeting moments of, of goodness, but no, it was agony, it was hell. Well, anybody you talk to who worked on the series, and there is a brilliant book, came out in 1991, I believe. So a good uh, 20 years after the Tomei book, a, a wonderful journalist, God bless him, he's gone now, Steve Sanders, wrote a book called Rainbow's End, The Judy Garland Show. And he talked to roughly 80 people who had been involved in the series, producers, directors, writers, chorus, everybody. And to a person, uh, they, thought Mel Torme was heinous when he worked on the show, that he was only interested in his singing spots, that the material he wrote for Judy was not really correct for her, which is true. He was writing this kind of cool, hip Mel Torme special material. And if there was any, there was nobody less cool than Judy Garland. She was hot. So they, you know, they all said, no, no, no. Then they were delighted to take part in Steve's book because it gave them a chance to set the record straight. Then Mort Lindsay, who got to be a good friend of Steve's and mine and many people, called Steve a couple weeks later and he said, I just ran into Mel Torme on the beach. And he said, who is this Sanders person? Why is he writing a book about Judy's show? I wrote that book. I told that story. And Mel said, what is he going to do that I didn't do? And Mort said, I told him, he's going to tell the truth. Whoa. Well, many people say that the failure of her TV series started Judy on her personal decline. Do you agree? I think, again, that is hindsight. Uh, I think if you look at her life the last five years, it was as much a roller coaster as it had ever been. But I think Judy was just winding down. I think she was so physically tired from doing everything, from having to prove herself over and over and over again. 
I mean, by the mid 40s, she had been working for the better part, uh, by the mid 60s, pardon me, she'd been working for the better part of 35 years. And that's a point in your life, she was only in her early 40s. That's when people are going to retire after they've worked for 35 years. But she didn't have the funds on which to do that. And she had to work when work was not right for her, when, you know, rest would have been better. And again, during those years, the two or three times I'd have, have to stop and calculate, but the times again, as she had so often, when she tried to get off the medication, she knew that it was bad for her and wrong for her. And she didn't like being dependent on, on pills. At any rate, she tried uh, less than a year before she died. She had gone to Peter Ben Brigham Hospital in Boston again and gone on a withdrawal program. She'd done it in the summer of 1965. But every time she got well, or was on the track to getting well again, she had no recourse but to jump right back into work because there was no money. And there was no money coming in from Manelli or Sid to support the kids. Liza, of course, by this point was pretty much out on her own, but still, Judy, you know, if, if she didn't work, they didn't eat. When Freddie and David pretty much washed their hands of her and she sued them and they sued her and Sid sued them in 1966, um, she went back to Sid for a year and a half of management, but that that's the a sad thing to have to return to Sid Luft uh, and give him another chance to, which he did brilliantly, uh, an 80 concert tour. And again, none of that money did she see. Most of it went to the government because Sid hadn't paid the taxes. I don't think she, she had a chance. I think you look at her from baby gum days on because of her parents, because of uh, the environment at MGM, because of the gentleman she trusted, because of her own physical frailties of being that vulnerable, honest, real person. She put herself into the cement mixer because it's what she was born to do. She was born to entertain, no question. She said that very, very often. But Norman Jewison, who directed some of the series shows and one of her specials, and who regards her as the greatest talent of any that he ever worked with, he said, I've never seen talent handled the way she was. It was just ridiculous that she was forced into doing the things she was forced into doing. Always right. was told for her own good. Judy Garland has widely been considered to be one of the great iconic figures for gay men. In fact, the Stonewall riots, which took place right after she died, are often connected to her death. Why do you think gay men love her so much? Well, I don't think it's just gay men. I think it's gay men and women, certainly, uh, first of all. Um, I think, again, because of the honesty that they could see her in a movie or in a concert or in a TV show. And she, again, she was, she was allowed or she was incapable of not expressing her realist self. And if you were gay in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, expressing your realist self wasn't anything you were allowed to do, even on a, in a low key way. What was the authenticity? Well, certainly her reality. Yeah, the fact that, um, and, and I think they got the sense that for everything she had been through uh, in the, at Metro that they heard about and in the 50s, the ups and downs, and then in the 60s, more ups and downs, um, there was just this sense of empathy that, by golly, every time they write her off, she comes back and she comes back with joy and energy and uh, vivacity and this wonderful come and enjoy everything with me. That was when I saw the concerts, that what it was all about. It was like, come up here and breathe this extraordinarily rarefied air that you're not going to find anywhere else. You got that from her. It didn't take flash powder. It didn't take snakes. It didn't take Bustier out to here. It all it took was Judy on the stage, and uh, I, I think I think that's why all audiences liked her. In 2001, ABC produced an Emmy award-winning miniseries based on Judy's daughter Lorna's book, *Me and My Shadows*. You were a creative consultant on that show. What was it like working with Lorna Luft? Well, I had known Lorna for uh, 25 years before that, increasingly uh, as as a friend. Uh, the first time we really worked together was the PBS Concert Years special in 1985. And she came to realize that I was somebody who was a fan of her mother's, but who knew her mother very, very well and uh, wasn't about to stand for anything negative that wasn't true about her mother. And she came to trust me in that way. And so she had asked me to work on the series with her. And uh, 
we talked about it, but basically my dealings were with the director and the screenwriter and the musical supervisor in terms of, okay, what songs for this scene and what songs for that scene. So I would guide them to, well, this is what they would have been singing or this is what they could have been singing. These are the recordings to try to license. And of course they were able to license everything. Um, I have a stack of scripts about, well, that tall of me and my shadows from beginning to end. And they would send them to me and ask for comments. And I would you know, say, uh, the truth is more interesting. The truth is more interesting. The truth is more interesting. And they'd say, okay, tell us what the truth is. And uh, they were determined to get that right, uh, which is something that you will not find in the Sid Luft uh, book or in the Sid Luft documentary. But- um, Will you find it in the Rene Zellweger movie? I have no interest in the Renee Zellweger movie. I saw the clips, I heard her sing, I saw what she looked like. I talked to people who saw it and who told me about all the factual inaccuracies. All I can say for the Renee Zellweger movie is that it was the best promoted, best public relations job in history because even before they started filming, it was all of these declarations. We love her, we're gonna tell the truth, we're gonna do the best by her. And after you hear that for a year and you hear it again when the film comes out, and Renee says, oh, we, we, I love her and we did her justice. It's like, no, you didn't. The truth is more interesting. Uh, you showed her doing things that she never in a million years would have done or did do. And I'm sorry, when you've got Judy Garland singing in a whiny little voice with somebody whose eyes are scrunched up like that, I'm sorry. It's just, it was a great vanity production. Hallelujah for all of them. But it wasn't Judy Garland. One of Judy's boyfriends before marrying Mickey Deans was songwriter John Mayer. He wrote a book about her called Heartbreaker, and Mickey Deans wrote a book about Judy called Weep No More My Lady. And even a secretary, Stevie Phillips, wrote a book. All of these people wrote about how hard they tried to keep Judy from destroying herself with alcohol and pills. Do you think anyone was capable of saving her? Yeah, somebody who wasn't in it for themselves. Uh, Stevie Phillips had all that ambition to become an agent. Uh, John Meyer had songs to purvey. Um, I, again, I'm not saying that these people didn't care about her, but she needed, by the 1960s, she needed the kind of care that uh, meant total absence of pressure, total um, calm. Financial security. Well, financial security would have been, help. again, uh, we were talking earlier about her attempts to get off the pills. Uh, I've seen letters from people who were fans who became friends of hers. And after her last stay at Peter Ben Brigham, so this would be like August, uh, September of 1968, how well she was, how she was working so hard at being healthy, how she was singing beautifully, how, you know, once off the medication, uh, once away from all of that, she was fine. Uh, she, her voice was there till the day she died. Uh, but again, the pressures of doing it and doing it and doing it. The fact too that, uh, again, when I was 13 and 14 and seeing her on TV and she was singing many of the old arrangements, it was like, I thought, why aren't they dropping the key a step? Why should she have, have to keep singing notes that, uh, she's got more notes on the bottom now. Everybody's voice drops as they get older. Sinatra dropped his keys. Liza, by the time Liza finished, she was singing almost an octave lower than she had started. There's nothing wrong with that. They want to hear you. They want to see you. Uh, but no, but no. Well, well, Sid would take the money and go to the track as opposed to going to the orchestrator and saying, let's take everything down a half a step or a whole step. Just mismanagement and bad luck. And we talk about this. And then you look at her legacy. You look at what she left. And it's like, how dare we spend time talking about all of this stuff when you can revel in the absolute glories of what she did from we've got footage of her at age seven being darling up to recordings of her, you know, months before she died, where she's still kicking it across as as best she can. And the audience is still going crazy. Do you think Judy Garland really got how incredibly talented she was and how beloved she was by her fans? Yes, I, I don't think there's any question of that. But the the backside of that is that as she went off stage, there was still no money. There was still nobody uh, to go with whom to go home or to go home to. There was still this sense of having to compete with memories of herself that dated back 10, 20, 30 years. All of that, uh, that's a, an amazing burden for one person, especially well, in a sensitive as she. 
If you could talk to her now, what would you say to her? Thank you. That, that's what I said to her the night I met her uh, after the show in Chicago. We talked for no more than 60 seconds. And, and I said something that made her laugh. And then she said something that made me laugh. And um, I said, anyway, and I'd already thanked her for the show and everything. And I, then I, I had to turn, you know, she was finishing up. She had finished her dinner. I didn't want to interrupt that. But I just, the last thing I said to her was, thanks for everything. And that was the first time in 60 seconds, the smile left her face. And with great solemnity and great sincerity and great simplicity, she looked deep into my eyes and she said, thank you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, this is not unique to me. There are Judy Garland fan scenes. Hundreds of fans had that kind of moment with her and, and many more moments with her than that. But uh, I am so profoundly grateful that I was given that opportunity, that God looked down and said, okay, John, you go over to her table, even though you're 16 and the adults with whom you're dining think you're crazy to go over there, you go over there. And I did. Oh, I'm so glad you did. And I think she would have been thrilled to see all of your books. They've brought so much joy to me. I, I know you have two more books coming out in the fall. One about the Wizard of Oz, one about White Christmas. Yeah. Will you come back uh, to talk about those books when they come out? I would be delighted, Harvey. This is, we, we found in our telephone introduction two weeks ago that we could communicate. And I think we've done a lot of that today. And I will come back and talk about anything uh, about which I have something to say. Do you have a favorite Garland album? Mine is Carnegie Hall. Oh, I think if I was told I could only take one away with me somewhere, it would have to be Carnegie Hall. But again, there's so many I like. Uh, the, most of the Capitol albums from the 50s are such beautiful studio work. Uh, some of her DECA things where she's singing things that she didn't sing in the movies. There's, there's a song called Smiling Through. There's a song called uh, This Heart of Mine. Uh, no Love, No Nothing. Uh, uh, All God's Children Got Rhythm. This little, this young woman, this little kid, singing so beautifully and right up to the end of her life uh you mentioned john meyer and his songs she sang four of them on tv less than six months before she died and one of them was it's all for you and it was not a night a night when she was in good voice but she acts these 32 bars of song and it's a love song but when she sang it that night it was like a declaration of her life to anybody who had ever heard her the last eight bars are when life is through when all my days are done by every star above, it's you I love, the only one. And let them say this much was true. It was all for you. She sang that on the Johnny Carson show. I've watched it numerous times. It was a Christmas show because she sang a Christmas song right after that. I really believed that she was singing that to her fans and that she somehow knew at some spiritual level that she was near the end. Possibly. Um, I think she knew that her resources were smaller, uh, but again, she had to work because she needed money just to pay rent. But again, if you see her, hear her, it, there was never any sense of, uh, of giving up with Judy. It was get up and go and sing because that's what I do. And she loved to sing. She, she said uh, during the Carnegie Hall tour in 61, how much fun it was to sing with good orchestration and a good band. She loved to do it. She did not love to be forced to do it. She did not love to do it when she didn't feel up to it. When any of us don't feel particularly well or have the flu, we can call in sick. As Judy said, the show must go on. And you know, it was somebody holding the money who made up that one. <laughs> Well, John, this has been a real pleasure. You're such a wealth of information. You are a walking encyclopedia about Judy Garland. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your insights with us. Well, thank you for the opportunity. A lot of it is just personal opinion from all the years of, of research and meeting and interviewing, but I try to get it as right for her as I possibly can because I think she deserves that. And I think a lot of people haven't. You ask brilliant questions and things that, um, it's like answer folding out of answer folding out of answer because you ask a question and then I answer it, but there are then tributaries that go off that river that, you know, sometimes need to be addressed too. Thank you, Harvey, very, very much. Well, thank you again. Our guest has been Judy Garland expert, John Fricke. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time.
Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.